if you don't cross train off the mat, it may engender a kind of mindset of harmony. But again, what happens off the mat when you're a positive thinker and you don't like sparring and you just meditate your negative thoughts away and you don't deal with the emotional triggers that come up between egos in conflict? In order to make good on its truth claims, Aikido requires both cross training on and off the mat. If you don't meditate or have a mindfulness practice off the mat, I would question what you're doing on the mat as moving meditation. Mm. But the second thing is it would serve people to not just do spiritual practice, but to engage in psychological forms of inquiry. Mm. When you don't know what you don't know in self-development, just like learning some of the most basic things about mindsets and the victim mindset. So little pieces like that, coaching, if you don't want to go to therapy, try coaching. That is the self-development methodology of our day. So at least you begin to be more self-authoring about what your goals are and how to pursue them. Hey everyone. So today we have another special video and I know I like to say they're all special, but I really feel that way. And this one, I had a blast recording. It was a really interesting conversation I had with Nathaniel Chalkin. And now I know that maybe not everyone will be interested in this subject because we dove quite deep and looked at some theories, but also at some very practical stuff too. So if you are interested in the subject of applied Aikido philosophy, you're definitely going to dig this talk. Now, if you don't know who Nathaniel Chalkin is, uh, what makes uh, our relationship very interesting is because, first of all, he went through a very, very similar journey like I did just years ago before me. Uh, he also was a devoted Aikido practitioner for many years and eventually he started questioning it and left Aikido and started training mixed martial arts, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and also educated himself in various fields such as executive coaching and from what I understand he has a lot of expertise and knowledge in various uh, fields outside of uh, martial arts. And uh, he, what's, what makes again his uh, particular story interesting is because he started to also take a look back at Aikido and to ask himself and uh, explore how it can be applied not only physically, which he does as well, in a practical way, but also psychologically or, you know, an executive level and in, in, in personal development in spirituality. So, so he's, you know, the person to talk to about this stuff. Personally, one of the reasons why I was really thrilled to talk to Nathaniel about all of this is because, as you may already know, because I keep repeating myself, I uh, recently rediscovered an interest to explore the Aikido philosophy and what impact it may have, but also to ask myself, how would it look if it would be really practical? How, how should it be trained? How it should be practiced? And Nathaniel already has a lot of answers uh, for that subject, uh, which we will explore. And a lot of that is going to be about cross training, but not only physically, but also mentally. So one of the core ideas we touched, which we'll look into deeper during this conversation is, you know, that Aikido philosophy, Aikido gen uh, tends to often present itself as, you know, kind of practice of meditation and personal development, spirituality. And one of the ideas we, we spoke about, which I found really inspiring, is that if you want to teach meditation, you have to go through a intensive course of understanding how meditation works. If you want to coach people, you need to go for a good course of coaching. And, and that may be one of the downsides to Aikido is that you're just learning the techniques, you're just learning the martial arts, some philosophy, but you don't get specific training for all of those subjects. And that's why potentially it makes it so difficult to really make the philosophy practi uh, practical. So uh, I don't want to spoil uh, too much. Uh, all of that is going to be covered and much more in the conversation. So if I got your interest, do enjoy this talk. It's uh, good to see you again. Great to see uh, you. Yeah. Not the first, not the last time, I, I hope. <laughs> Definitely. And uh, plenty of things I want to talk to. And, and because we've already covered, uh, we already spoke with each other quite a few times, maybe one of one quick brief thing I would ask uh, as the first question would be like a very uh, kind of short and dense uh, version of your background. So mm -hmm. just people would be familiar with what fields you're educated at or, or what uh, ex expertise you have kind of a, you know, like a, a short breakdown of uh, what are you, what are you about? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Happy to do it. 
Um, so going all the way back, I, I was actually raised in a community that practices transcendental meditation. So we were about 3,000 people in a town of 10,000. And it, that meant consciousness-based education uh, and studying principles of Eastern spirituality in the midst of just college prep kind of high school. So all the regular subjects and so on. And went to university in the same way. Um, I also studied Aikido like you did. It started as a young teenager, 13 years old. And that was just my total love and passion. And um, then also like you became Uchi Deshi, long-term Uchi Deshi, was about two years overall living in a dojo, a uh, couple different dojos, a brief trip to Japan in the midst of that. But like you also had total you know, disillusionment, burnout. Uh, I'm not actually sure if you got burnt out, but I sure did. And I could see you. Yeah. yeah, at least on the, the disillusionment front, and it really had an ego death in the midst of mm -hmm. Uh, a sensei who also I did not get along with um, and felt very conflicted and let down by in terms of the promise of Aikido. So that same, you know, while I was still Uchideshi in the dojo, I was devouring Gracie Jiu Jitsu videos, trained my first week at Hicks and Gracie's and ultimately left the dojo. And I didn't realize it at the time, but I really had quit Aikido. And I went to start training in mixed martial arts with Alan and Lily at SBG NorCal, which is one of Matt Thornton's gyms. And really great training, great mindset in that gym. Felt really welcome and open there. Um, I went on to get ranked in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, blue belt with uh, Sergio Silva and purple belt with Phil Cardella, who's a, a House and Gracie guy and WEC fighter. And all along the way, um, as I was leaving Uchideshi as well, I did a coaching certification and a master's degree in integral psychology at the same time. Um, and that led me to founding Integral Martial Arts. It, I was trying to hold the best parts of East and West and traditional and modern and development on the mat and off the mat for martial artists. So this kind of well-rounded holistic approach, but not just holistic in the sense of the new age postmodern Aikido version of holistic. So really bridging East and West in that sense. So that's been my back burner project, you know, having my own dojo along the way. Um, and uh, I did get hired as an executive coach for a um, integral leadership program that was based in Dallas. So I coached uh, middle market executives um, through that program for about uh, six and a half years. And since then, I've uh, split out on my own, wearing my own jersey, uh, Polyster Leadership, uh, and we do in-house coaching, in-house coaching for leaders, teams, and organizations. So we're really applying a lot of the martial arts philosophy um, and the notion of having a gym or a dojo and coaching as a practice, as a way of life. So in-house means instead of going somewhere else to do a training that just starts and stops, just like you can't learn jujitsu in a weekend seminar, you can't learn leadership either. So we try to build the coaching in-house and we turn it into a practice so that through peer coaching, just like you do a jujitsu class, you watch the sensei or professor demonstrate, and then you partner up in practice. So we're really committed to the practice of coaching and leadership inside of organizations. So we help them build permanent structures to offer coaching in-house to everyone in the company. So that's mm -hmm. what I've been up to. Nice. Uh, there's, again, plenty of things I will want to ask, and I won't, I'll, I'll do my best not to dwell on this part too much, but there's something I just really wanted to ask. I think we spoke about this briefly when we met uh, before, but you mentioned growing up uh, and being educated about transcendental meditation and, I guess, spirituality from an early age and as through for, for your kind of period of, of growing up. Uh, now that you look back, uh, how, how do you consider, like, how do you see that whole process? Was it uh, a great one and it really shaped into, into who you are? Or do you see some lacks in it that you later try to fill up with what you learned on your own? Like, is there anything you could say here? Yes, and it's very likely the theme of what we were intending to talk about here today in general. Um, mm -hmm. With meditation or spirituality as a practice, um, it, it was a beautiful foundation to have that in my life. 
Um, so to say that first and foremost, that you're interested in um, the development of consciousness and the development of higher states of consciousness or realizing there are levels of human potential beyond what we think of as normal and that through regular practice of meditation and considering universal principles in life, whatever religion or uh, philosophy they come from, you can live a more fulfilled life. So it is the process of self-actualization universally. Like that's a good thing. It's beautiful mm -hmm. to have that kind of uh, community structure around that. It's like really unusual. Like they would meditate, you know, have group meditation uh, before and after work. So it wasn't such a materially focused or exclusively materially focused community. They also tended to the balance. Um, you, you can see this um, on a national level in a company, uh, country like Burma, where they have gross domestic product, but they also have gross domestic happiness. So there's a balancing of the spiritual and material life. And it's not that we're that country is against progress. They just say if progress comes at the expense of happiness or inner fulfillment, then they question whether that's healthy. So I, I think ultimately, in the best sense of things, in the business world, we have conscious capitalism as well. So you have the balance of like absolutely unapologetic free market capitalists who want to succeed, who want to who, who don't want to do well, um, and you can be more conscious. You can do good in the way that you organize your business and the kind of higher purpose that inspires why you exist. So all of that to say yes to uh, a meditation or a spiritual community. And uh, there is a problem that can occur in spiritual communities, as I think um, you and I both experience firsthand with Aikido, as well as the spiritual uh, martial art. Yeah. And um, often because uh, spiritual communities are rooted, they, they look very postmodern, they look very new age, but they're often tied to traditional hierarchies. Mm -hmm. that have to do with dogmatic thinking or group think or top-down hierarchies where you're not allowed to think critically or push back or question or spar. So it's all kind of rolls together. And the, the summary statement I have for that is called spiritual bypassing. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, I didn't coin that phrase. It's been around, I think John Wellman coined it. You can look that up later. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a book by Robert Augustus Masters called Spiritual Bypassing. And what it says is if you're only spirituality and not psychology, then you will use spirituality to bypass the things that matter most. Mm -hmm. And you can be, you can have a, as Carl Jung would say, you can have a very thick shadow. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, they don't call it the unconscious for nothing. We all have blind spots and meditation does not allow you um, to take care of your emotional triggers your you know the things that come up when your ego gets involved the mm -hmm. conflicts between people that requires psychology um, mm -hmm. so uh, often spirituality g gives the promise of transcending those things you don't have to put your attention on those things mm -hmm. just be positive mm -hmm. or just get enlightened be spiritually awake awakened mm -hmm. and then all that stuff goes away and it's actually very dehumanizing. It's ironically very dehumanizing um, mm -hmm. to have that kind of approach. So that is the challenge with spirituality mm -hmm. by itself. That's, that's really fascinating stuff. And, and uh, that concept of bypassing the, what I, what I see now, uh, Jung called the shadow self, shadow side. It's, I'm still shadow, the, the shadow, stuff. yeah. You just called it the, the shadow. shadow. Mm. It's, uh, I've, I've bumped into this concept a few times lately and I was really fascinated because it, right away I felt kind of an intrinsic feeling, like a, an intuitive feeling that I, I see there's truth in it. It relates to my own experience. So I'm really looking forward to dive into this subject. Uh, one thing I do want to kind of bring to the table, uh, I do want us to focus as much as we can organically also around the subject of Aikido, how it relates to Aikido. Hmm. Uh, and uh, and obviously not only to it, but then naturally I'm thinking about the subject of Aikido, mm -hmm. and also uh, well we have to share experience for it. And I I do want to do my best to talk these days. I can kind of set to try to do my best to be on the positive side of Aikido. Mm -hmm. so I can't refrain from sometimes bringing up the the dark side of it. So, so with all of that said, uh, what's on my mind is 
Uh, so I imagine that that's one of the explanations of why uh, one of the things I was quite vocal about and critical is Aikido is officially a spiritual, or not necessarily officially a spiritual practice, but it's tend to be like a spiritual martial arts, philosophy mm -hmm. martial art. And uh, it's often dubbed as the art of peace. And it's supposed to be a practice which makes peaceful people and uh, all the conflict resolution and everything is spoken about that. But uh, not only myself, but also connected to so many people online, I've heard, I've experienced it and I heard from many, many people who would meet a lot of arrogant people in Aikido. And not to say all of them are arrogant, that's, that would be untrue, but arrogance is, is not uncommon in Aikido. Also yoga comes to my mind too. I've, I've been a yoga instructor, I've been around yoga circles and, and I noticed that it would be, often it would be like a subtle ego, like a subtle arrogance. But if, if, you are, if you have your eyes wide enough, wide open enough, you're like, oh my goodness, you know, this, is, this is horrible. So uh, I think I, I spoke a little too long, but I imagine you see what I'm pointing out. I'm just wondering, so that uh, arrogance in practices which are supposed to develop better human beings through spirituality, like Aikido, like yoga, like other practices, uh, that arrogance, do you think, would you say it's that a result of that bypassing of the shadow or is it a bit something else? I think that's a very simple way of saying it, yes, because think about what arrogance is covering. What is the shadow of arrogance? It's insecurity. Mm. And this is the thing we start to see specifically with Aikido. It's a really great physical metaphor to talk about mm. the problem of bypassing. Because the promise of Aikido is nonviolent conflict resolution. The promise mm -hmm. of Aikido is spiritual awakening where you are actually feeling one with everything in harmony with all types of people that you can enter into conflict with a centered presence without having your ego triggered and you can transform whatever you meet into peace. Now that sounds beautiful by itself and to hold up Aikido as one of, if not the only example of a spiritual martial art, would be to say that it gets a lot right and not just from a spiritual standpoint in its philosophy and its promise. Mm. For example, very easy to talk about the shadow with martial arts because you have um, a fight going on. There's me and there's an opponent. And mm. the founder would say, um, true victory is victory over oneself. Mm. That's beautiful. Well, that's shadow work. That's mm. realizing the enemy is within. Mm. That's talking about love your enemy or love your neighbor as yourself. And what I judge in, you know, that when you point the finger, there's three fingers pointing back. Mm. That's the simplest way to understand the shadow is. What I judge in you, I might be guilty of myself. Mm. So if, if I look at a conflict between two people, um, how can I see you clearly if I don't look in the mirror at myself first? So that's shadow work. That's what Aikido is promising, that you can transform who you are um, by taking care of your own hypocrisy. And then you can re-engage the conflict and the presence you bring to it will be transformative. Mm. So that, that's a full stop on that concept. Like, look in the mirror at myself first. If I think you're an angry, aggressive person, where am I an angry, aggressive person? and take care of that and come at it with a more assertive energy rather than an aggressive energy. Hmm. And that's a shift in mindset. That's a shift in energy. So I, Aikido promises all of that, hmm. but the, the hypocrisy, the problem starts to come in when you become so attached to nonviolence that you hmm. don't even spar. So you repress violence. Hmm. This is another great illustration of the shadow. There's nothing healthy about it at all. And so you push it down, you deny it, and you make it wrong and bad, and then you project that out into the world and make an enemy of it. What happens when you do that, ironically, is it's like cutting off your nose despite your face. There's something about violence that if we're not in touch with it, then we're not actually capable of attaining a nonviolent outcome. Mm. And that's the hypocrisy. That's the performative contradiction of a lot of postmodern approaches. I'm mm. so attached to nonviolence that I repress violence. And so when I 
and then here's the other irony i'm, I'm a pacifist so when i actually meet with violence you can see that arrogance come out people become very who've never sparred what happens when they think they know and they start sparring they become aggressive mm -hmm. Yeah. So that so it's very clear actually with Aikido, like the promise is there. It's beautiful in principle, and you have to be able to fight in order to fight without fighting. You have yeah. to turn towards the shadow, and in, find a healthy expression or integrate the experience, your relationship with violence. You have to come to terms with your anger. You have to come to terms with your fear, and of course, sparring is how you do that. Yeah. Then you own what, what so many quotes we've heard through our different interviews. It's like, would you rather be a, a gardener in a war or a warrior in a garden? Mm. You know, or only um, the warrior can choose pacifism. Everyone else is condemned to it. Mm. So there's a way of integrating. The yin yang is a beautiful symbol for that. Mm. Like when you're capable of both then you can choose that if you're capable if you're strong enough then you can choose mercy hmm. so that would that would be to um yeah just say a bit about it <laughs> at the top sure, sure. and there's more of course well one thing i uh wanted to specifically ask you again about leading from what you said um you you're you know that Recently, I, to my own surprise, rediscovered an interest in the Aikido philosophy and realized the Aikido philosophy did have impact on my life. And uh, there's a growing desire to better understand how it works, but also recognition that what I consider that a lot of the Aikido community fails to deliver the promise of Aikido, the one you described. And I don't want to be judgmental. I don't want to see everyone. There's always exceptions. There's always unique schools. But the majority, it doesn't seem like it's really delivering it, especially at the martial aspect. But that's I like, I already, I don't want to be a broken record. <laughs> I've yeah. spoken about that so much. Uh, but the philosophical aspect, um, that too, it's, it seems to be, I do know some people who are, who seem to be more or less like a, potential embodiment of embod embodiment of the Aikido philosophy, but it's not like that common. It's not, I always like to kind of look at the results and to see if, if, if this thing always or, or most of the times creates this result, it probably means this thing really works. So in Aikido, it's hard to say that. So mm -hmm. again, having said that, what would you say as the, um, not necessarily the cure, the cure, but maybe like the solution mm -hmm. to that shadow work side and um, uh, that whole dilemma with the Aikido philosophy. What would be a good way to go in your opinion for the? Uh, that's what I like to say. Apply the Aikido philosophy. Right. What would make make it uh, test proof? What would make it potentially efficient to a degree where obviously not everyone learns everything. There's no way to make it 100% proof, but it would make it much more effective. Yes. So, well, let's look at Aikido's truth claim on and off the mat. It's simply put, it's um, certainly self-defense for starters and also protecting your opponent, but let's keep it self-defense and self-development on mm. and off the mat. Is that fair to say? Uh, that's one of the claims, right? Yeah. Okay. So, so let's look at that. What does self-defense actually require on the mat? It requires cross-training. Mm. It requires seeking universal truth. I mean, think about Bruce Lee talking about this. Like there is no Japanese way, Korean way, Chinese way. Mm. There's just the human body. So there's what works and there's what doesn't. And you engage in a process of continuous improvement and continuous growth and growth when you're willing to take on that mindset, that more rational mindset. Because in other words, you have to grow your own. You know, the delivery systems in different cultures, martial arts are ultimately all the same. So you find what works universally through cross-training and then growing your own approach. Same thing off the mat. Mm. And I think it is worth saying that it's just more, it's not that there's right and wrong. There, there's good in what Aikido is offering on the mat as um, 
a martial yoga practice, as moving meditation. You know, it can become part of a, a life practice, um, just like studying any art would. You know, studying dance, for example, or how to drive your car on the track. There's an art to master. Um, so that's good. Um, however, if you don't cross train off the mat, then the promise of Aikido is no different from studying any other art. It may engender a kind of mindset of harmony. But again, what happens off the mat when you're a positive thinker and you don't like sparring and you just meditate your negative thoughts away and you don't deal with the emotional triggers that come up between egos and conflict? So my suggestion is that in order to uh, make good on its truth claims, Aikido requires both uh, cross training on and off the mat. So for example, um, if you don't meditate or have a mindfulness practice off the mat, um, then I would question what you're doing on the mat as moving meditation. Mm. So that's, uh, that's one thing. Um, but the second thing is it, it would serve people to um, not just do spiritual practice, but to engage in psychological forms of inquiry. Mm. So that could just be psychotherapy, which, you know, people think you have to be sick to go to therapy. <laughs> well, we're all mentally ill in some sense. And it's amazing that when you don't know what you don't know in self-development, um, mm -hmm. just like learning some of the most basic things about mindsets and the victim mindset and family dynamics where one person's the persecutor to the victim and then a rescuer comes in that creates that's the drama triangle that creates all dramas in history so little pieces like that um coaching if you don't want to go to therapy try coaching that is the self-development methodology of our day so at mm -hmm. least you begin to be more self-authoring about what your goals are and how to pursue them and a coach mm -hmm. of course helps you pursue um your own hero's journey we could say in this context so that you're self-actualizing in that way um, and then the, the other thing that Aikido does uniquely as a martial art, and again, you can do this in any martial art, but I think Aikido is built as a somatic practice. And again, to quote Bruce Lee, ultimately, all types of knowledge mean self-knowledge. So when you're training physically on the mat, what do we say? You learn more about someone in 30 minutes of grappling with them than you do in an, a week of conversation. And why would that be? Because you feel how they are. You feel their mindset. Some people like to push people over. Other people are the pushover. So there's a way of working on yourself. And a, a lot of integral coaches, I have a friend who's a, a brown belt in jujitsu, Kevin Snorf. Um, and he's an integral coach as well. And he helps martial artists. Uh, they use metaphors. And he, he rolls with them. And then he has said, and I've done this, of course, for years as well. You assess how they're showing up. And he told one guy, you're kind of like a bulldozer. You know, that's, that's, your, that's your game A. It's like, you're, you bulldoze people. And that's great, but if you want to be more well-rounded as a martial artist, you need to learn to surf. You know, and what's different about that? So that's another example of using physical practice to hold the mirror up to your own mindset. And then guess what? How you show up on the mat is also how you show up off the mat. Do you bulldoze people at work? Do you bulldoze people in your personal relationships? Do you bulldoze your kids? I bet you do. And what would it mean to surf? And that's again, what a coach or a therapist would help someone do. Um, so lastly, um, the notion of shadow work itself, um, or, or I would say there's, there's two dimensions, you know, shadow work itself, um, looking at the things that trigger you emotionally. So if it informs you versus it affects you, that's the litmus test for shadow. So if you're mm. triggered by someone, that's the opening for shadow work. And I could talk mm. about that separately. Uh, and then the other thing is obviously the, the judo move, the Aikido move is how do you resolve conflict through mm. conscious communication? Mm. So, so these are all the things you can cross train in. Um, and, you know, you can simplify it uh, through the integral model. There's like work you do on yourself. 
there's the communication and conflict related stuff. And then there's your life in the world, you know, coaching towards your goals. So that's, that's as simply as I could say it. Hmm. Well, taking a bit of a look back into IQ um, regarding the subject, uh, as you spoke, it reminded me of this uh, fresh story, fresh experience I had. Uh, a friend of mine sent me this questionnaire, questionnaire of an IQ organization in one of the countries, Western countries, where they started to recognize that maybe IQ needs to change, and they were interested to see what directions the people would vote mm, that Aikido could go to or what they would mm -hmm. expect from it. And one of the options was that if Aikido should become more, should if this, the meditational aspect of Aikido should be more mm, emphasized or kind of the coaching aspect of it. I don't, think they, I don't think they used the word coaching, but kind of the mentality and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I was discussing this about my friend, uh, with my friend about that, uh, my first direct thought was what I said to him. I was like, well, if they would decide that they want to bring in more of the meditational aspect to their IQ classes, what will they base that on? Mm -hmm. You know, how did Aikido prepare them to be a meditation coach or a mentor mm -hmm. or a guide? And I said to my friend, I said, well, they would naturally, like the, the real smart option, as far as I can see, would be for them to educate themselves in, let's say, at least in mindfulness, some kind of mindfulness training or something. Now, I don't know, you know, if, if that questionnaire will go to that direction and they will come to that decision. I don't know if that's what they will do. But to me, like that, that brings back the idea of what which you presented, the, the cross-training aspect. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, as I'm thinking about the philosophy of Aikido, it just seems that the tools that are given in Aikido to live the Aikido philosophy, they just don't really seem to be enough. That's one of the criticisms I had, criticisms I had out loud these days is that you know, how do you really learn the philosophy that Osensei was saying? Like, what's the methodology to teach it? And it doesn't seem like there's really a lot of substance there. It would only make sense if an Aikido person who wants to deliver the Aikido philosophy would, I guess, cross train, as you say, which I like about that idea, that concept, learn the, the ways which are already developed that support the, the philosophy of Aikido and would bring it through the Aikido platform. So mm -hmm. again, a bit of a long-winded uh, way to express my thoughts, but but do you, do you agree with that sense for that direction, or would you say there's a different solution, or just basically, if an Aikido instructor would want to deliver the Aikido philosophy, which would be applied, is is it true then? Is would you say it's correct to say that probably he would he have to go outside of Aikido, learn the existing tools which are already out there, and only then look how they work together. Yeah, it's a great question. And again, if the truth claim of Aikido is just to be a moving meditation or a self-development practice, then yeah, it doesn't, we don't have to talk about it being functional in a self-defense setting. It's a worthy pursuit in and of itself, but it still yeah. does beg the question of how do you create a functional outcome if that's your goal? Yeah. And again, for me, that requires cross-training. And, and it's worth mentioning again here in, in the realm of worldviews that we have traditional martial artists. Many Aikidoka are traditional martial artists. And you have the modern, traditional modern, postmodern. Modernists are typically doing combat sports. And then you have postmodern Aikidoists who, have, who really are into it because it's a form of self-development. And you can tell the postmodern um, Aikidoists apart from the traditionalists because the traditionalists are very strict. They're probably doing, you know, Iwama style or Yoshinkan or something like that. Whereas the postmodern kind of Aikidoists really are into the spirituality, the non-duality, the non-violent conflict resolution. They, they have more of that new age worldview or spiritual worldview. So that's why I say it depends on who the instructor is um, because an instructor who is more oriented to the postmodern kind of Aikido maybe they do have a meditation practice 
Maybe they do practice nonviolent communication. Maybe they do study somatics. And maybe the way they teach on the mat, I mean, you look at Richard Strozzi Heckler, he coined the phrase embodied leadership. He coined the phrase somatic coaching. He's coached Fortune 1000 companies for decades. Mm. So he has a whole somatic coach training that brings embodiment principles, how to center yourself physically and how to you know, blend and redirect the energy of an attack. So that whole physical metaphor of Aikido, they practice that. But that's the point. You are only going to get better at what you practice. And I would be very concerned about taking people with a traditional hierarchical mindset, a dogmatic mindset, who have not practiced meditation. Like meditation is kind of a traditional practice. It's just sitting still. Yeah. That's the least of the worries. The problem is, again, not the spiritual, but the psychological. What do you do when you're triggered emotionally and you're in your ego? The stuff that doesn't come up on the meditation cushion. What do you do when there's conflicts between people and you're used to being above them in the hierarchy? It, it, it just creates all kinds of potential for abuse, and um, which is what spiritual bypassing does as well um, by itself. So, so, so that would be the problem. And I, again, Bruce Lee said six months of boxing and wrestling is worth 20 years of traditional martial arts. Mm -hmm. So ironically, you could be a better applied Aikido philosophy person, you know, it doesn't matter what martial art you studied. If you simply went and meditated for six months, studied shadow work, and did nonviolent communication, you would be better equipped as someone who had cross-trained than someone who had simply been in a traditional Aikido dojo for 20 years. Mm. Mm. And you may have even more to offer than that person off the mat. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, again, I, I really like what you're saying. It, it's really kind of ironic and, and almost like a tough situation. I think when you explain it that way, to me, it starts to show better and better why, and again, this may be my personal opinion, but I think it's a fair one. Uh, I like to consider that Aikido is somewhat of a, in, a, in a crisis. And I guess mm -hmm. it's been, it's spoken in the Aikido circle as well, as far as I can see, at least from time to time. So yeah, let's say, well, let's say there's a tendency that Aikido is in a crisis. What you mentioned, what you said, it kind of explains why, but there's, but it also kind of begs to look at the possible solution, but, but also just the, the question. And part of me, especially since I feel positive towards the Aikido philosophy these days, I do want to kind of try to stay in that positive mm -hmm. mindset and explore that positive out, potential outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, I could easily go to the dark side and the negative and be like, well, let's just drop this and let's just leave it be. But if we look at the positive side, uh, yeah, it really sounds like a troublesome situation because the more I look at it, the more I see that, as you said, like an, a, a person who is pursuing the, the philosophy of Aikido, embodying it, even more so if we look at both the physical and the psychological aspect, there's so much cross-training that that person basically has to do. The, the, the Aikido that is taught is unequipped to teach all of that through one class. But then if we would look at, let's say, a positive prediction, uh, play with thought, mm -hmm. how would you imagine Aikido evolving to become at least closer to what it's supposed to be, what it claims to be? Uh, how would, like, what direction would you suggest to Aikido as a global community force to go to, to really deliver what Aikido is promising. Yes, um, and there's a lot of good there uh, that we can integrate and use as a base. So the term dojo means place of the way. And that mm -hmm. has a great double meaning in English because it's, you know, even the pictograph of the kanji is a person walking along a path, mm -hmm. but it's the path of self-development. And the way is also the way you do something. So you're starting to look at yourself as a martial artist. It, so a dojo can become the place of the way. Um, often we think of, you know, the old, the old Greek approach to human development was similar. It's like they would wrestle in the palaestra and then they'd have philosophical dialogues around the outside. So there, it's about having a more, um, integrated community center kind of dojo 
offering. And this also can produce multiple streams of income for Dojo Cho, for gym owners who want to help their people develop. So it's, that's why I came around to integral martial arts. But even if we just keep it with Aikido and the kind of offerings that Aikido people would want to partake in, why um, would every Aikido dojo not also offer time to, for meditation? Many of them do. But to be a community in that way, let's be in the practice of meditation together, you know, before every class, why not? Um, and then what, what few other classes would you need to offer um, for people to start to develop themselves. Um, that's why we offer peer coaching. You could do a peer coaching class once a week or a couple times a week um, and get people into practicing nonviolent communication, conflict resolution in that sense, um, and also uh, coaching skills so that they're starting to make the connection between what am I working on and my technique on the mat? What does that tell me about who I am off the mat and how do I personally develop myself in that exact same way. So again, the whole thing about if I'm the bulldozer, what am I doing in my life to show up as that surfer who's a little more flow? That would be one or two additional classes. Um, and then you can also offer workshops on a more seasonal or monthly basis. Uh, and just like you bring in, you know, the, the sensei from Hombu Dojo and have a huge seminar with multiple dojos same thing like bring in the people mm. um, in each of these areas spiritually psychologically and somatically mm. so body mind spirit is the thing we like to say then have those offerings in your dojo and bring in the experts who can help people go deeper uh, on a monthly or, or quarterly basis mm. Mm. Yeah. again i i keep saying this but i do feel like that i, I like what you're saying and what it makes me reflect about even about my own journey. Uh, I was especially vocal about that in my recent videos on my new channel, mm -hmm. kind of really looking back at my, my experiences. And uh, one of the videos I made, I spoke in detail about me uh, being abandoned by my initial students. And it's, it's a long story in its own, but the whole point of that was that I grew up in an Aikido community I was developed into an instructor in Aikido community where I was kind of led to believe that being an Aikido instructor is enough. And there was a lot of meditation and spirituality in that community. And so there was a lot of work to do, but, but still now that I look back, to be fair, I wasn't given that many tools, especially evidence-based or you know, long-term, long-term tools, tools. They were more, what I see often in spirituality is an instructor, a head instructor, or guru teacher, having his own or her own personal experiences, which kind of work for them. Uh, emphasis on the kind of, not mm -hmm. always. And then they start to teach others that that's the way to go. That's the recipe. And I think it's it's an unfair to do. That's that's my my strong opinion that. That's not the way to go, to take your own experience and to suddenly, because it works for you, kind of, to tell it works for others. But I think that's, that's kind of what I went through. And when I was an Aikido instructor myself, just 22 years old, it's crazy to look back. But I remember I, I positioned myself in that position because I grew up in that community where I would be the deliverer of answers, solutions. And mm -hmm. uh, I remember actually the moment when I was asked by one of my older students uh, about his marital problems mm -hmm. and I was just like fresh 22 I, I didn't have that many of uh, serious relationships definitely wasn't married by then I, and I remember my mind was blank I, I had no clue you know I had no experience about that I think I was honest enough to realize that and and not to try to make up some you know, answer but but it just shows me now, now that I look back if I, I considered if I, if I would ever be in the position to give marital advice I would have to be a professional you know, marriage um, therapist or something. And then if, if I want to give advice on that area, other area, I should be an expert of that and so on and so forth. So it seems to me that that position does happen too often where a black belt, I think and it happens outside of Aikido as well. A black belt considers himself to be a black belt at everything, right. which is a false, <laughs> you know, it's a false approach. Uh, but but it also, it's, it seems like it's, it's a tough path, which personally I like tough. I like challenge, 
And when I think about that, uh, if I would, you know, b let's bring me back to me at 19 year old, when I was 19, I wanted to become an Aikido instructor really bad. And if somebody would have told me, oh, so then that means you will have to become, you know, a professional coach. You'd have to go through, you know, right now on the top of mind is like cognitive behavioral therapy or mm -hmm. psychology, you know, all those tools. I probably would have went for it and I'd be like, hell yeah, this is a long and hard path, but I can see how much I will bring back. Uh, but that wasn't out there. That wasn't the, the dominating idea. But now the more I listen to you and I think about it, it just seems like that almost seems like that's the only way to go. If somebody would really want to embody the entireness of Aikido philosophy and to deliver it. So these are kind of my mm -hmm. thoughts out loud, but, but I don't know if that brings up something in you. It, it really does. I mean, first of all, that I also was uh, made sensei at 18 years old of my dojo. <laughs> and so I came up against that, against that same problem pretty hard when I was teaching adults and kids and the whole thing. And ultimately, it, it fell apart. I mean, it didn't work out at that point, and even having been raised with meditation. So there was a lot of growing that I still had to do. Um, and I think, again, to speak in terms of worldviews, that the traditional hierarchical worldview in any culture has this guru disciple thing that goes on. And there's mm -hmm. something beautiful about that if the guru is actually meriting being put in that position. In other words, the difference between, obviously, the Eastern approach to that and a more modern approach is... Um, it's not a hierarchy of just position because then anyone can sit above you. And it's like we sit in the dojo, like everyone who joined the dojo after me sits to my left. Yeah. I'm better than them forever yeah. because there's never any sparring or pressure testing. It's, it's not a merit based hierarchy. You don't earn your way to the top of that kind of hierarchy. Traditionally you would inherit it by blood or, you know, by family, um, if not lineage blood, um, or just politics. So to, to enter the Western mindset where it's, the hierarchy is based on competence, it's based on merit, and that comes through, you know, for lack of a better term, sparring, mm -hmm. through contact with the world and taking responsibility for outcomes. That's a whole different kind of um, culture that evolves around um, who's responsible or in charge. And so, um, if the promise, again, of something is self-development, then yeah, why not have a master's degree in self-development, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and again, the, the difference between a democratic hierarchy and a traditional one is there are checks and balances on the executive. There are checks and balances, which means that the feedback flows up. In fact, if I go into a business to work with the CEO and their team, if, we're, if we really want to have a more democratic um, kind of relationship to power dynamics, then that CEO has to be willing to go first and hear the, direct, hear the freedom of speech, hear the direct feedback of every single team member. They have to start sparring. Mm -hmm. They have to hear that authentic feedback. So it, they get more feedback than everyone else if they're the leader. Mm -hmm. Think about your black belt in jujitsu. Like you've, you've literally tapped out more times than everyone else in that room that's how you earned your belt so th there is absolutely something that breaks down traditional hierarchy um, and if you want to kind of test for yourself where someone is coming from whether they're a guru or whether they're more like uh, a teacher or a president in a company or a, a country the, the difference will be how do they react under pressure when you spar with them, what happens? And are you really empowered to say what the truth as you see it? Are you empowered to speak truth to power? And if you aren't, then you know, beware. Um, that's where the shadow is going to lie. And you're gonna, you're gonna find out the hard way um, about that. There's a few questions that I have on my mind, but like the biggest one, I wanna make sure we tackle uh, related to everything we spoke about. So when we look at the Aikido philosophy and potentially making it applied Aikido philosophy, which 
from what I see you, you're already working on for years already, and I'm sure you're capable of it. Um, but there's, there's a question which is interesting to ask, and it, it does come out quite often, I guess, at least in my explorations. The question of the USP, the unique selling product, or, or just kind of what's the thing which this particular practice offers, which no one else offers. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a difficult question when Aikido is spoken of. I, I do have some answers there. Uh, but especially if we would focus on the philosophy of it, there's the argument that you know, a, a, a way of peace is not something entirely brand new. Maybe it could be the aspect of you know, martial arts plus the peaceful aspect. The, also, too, what comes to my mind is the life-giving sword, the life-taking sword, not necessarily emphasized as much, but so basically I do have my own ideas, but I'm really interested to hear what, 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 what opinion do you have when the discussion comes about? So, so what's the place of Aikido in the world? Like why, why, does, why should it have the right to exist versus like what is it that it really delivers unique to compare to anything else? Would, mm -hmm. you, would you have an answer for that? Yes. Um, so even if it is what it is on the mat, Aikido is a conscious martial art. Uh, now, I realize other martial arts kind of have the nage uke relationship, but not with the same mindset that Aikido is mm -hmm. bringing to it. So Aikido is about um, the cultivation of presence in the midst of an attack and the mindset, the intention is not to attack, not to be in one's ego, but to meet another's ego and to blend with that attack, to redirect it, and ideally to control that person without inflicting injury, without hurting them. Now, even if we look at physically other traditional martial arts, you don't really have the same kind of setup where the whole purpose of the art is to um, remove one's ego and to blend, to become one with that attack uh, even physically again and how we set up to train in Aikido there's always the attack and the response um, mm. and you are blending with it uh, and then pinning them and controlling them without hurting them so physically you're in the practice of harmonizing over and over and over again and I know a lot of traditional Aikidoists say like oh it's 90% of Temi and it, it's like look in jujitsu the first UFCs proved that you don't have to hit anyone at all to control them without hurting them so I think that still is the unique value proposition of Aikido. If you want to be part of a practice that um, asks of you that you be a conscious human being and not react out of your ego violently, and you want to practice resolving conflict nonviolently over and over again, and have that be your mindset when you enter into conflict, which means you're de-escalating, you're consciously communicating, and you're studying yourself. You're looking in the mirror at yourself first before you engage with another. That is the value proposition. It's the shadow work part of it, ironically. Um, and if you want to um, be that kind of human being off the mat, then again, you're going to have to do some of your own cross training. But you know that may also be another thing to touch on before we. I, I have time here, and it may really be worth touching on what are the best practices, what are the simplest practices that someone can do off the mat, whether they do Aikido or not. What does it mean to be a conscious martial artist? What does it mean to engage in your own self-development um, so that uh, you're effectively uh, not just engaged in the physical art, but you're growing as a person? And um, I think that's important also because I like to use the analogy for uh, more you know, people with a more of a modern mindset. It's like, if, if your goal is to be the best physically, why would you not upgrade your operating system? mentally how much of the game is mental yeah so if you tune the software on a car you get tons more horsepower out of that same engine so you know i think that's also what aikido is pointing to is you know it, it, it's not just about fighting how often have you been in a fight anyway so why are you doing this why are you training martial arts what is it what's the deeper uh, message what are the, the principles that you could use to inform your life and that can make you a better human a better father or mother a better manager at work if you want upward mobility with your job 
you're not going to make a very good manager of people, let alone a leader like an executive, if you don't start engaging your personal development. Mm. So, mm. yeah, well, that's definitely. I want to extend uh, down for looking at the best practices, but just very quickly before we head there, uh, something I'm super curious to ask you, your opinion about. So I'm 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 with you very much on the on the same page of seeing the uniqueness of Aikido in the martial aspect, uh, but just purely out of curiosity, I'm curious to ask: uh, Would you say if we re if we removed the martial aspect, uh, the physical aspect out of Aikido entirely, uh, and we would leave just the ideolo ideology of Aikido, just the per se philosophy, would you still say it's as unique, or would you say it's the it's the martial aspect which makes it so unique? Well, I think that's tough, right? Because as martial artists, it is a physical philosophy, um, mm -hmm. and the way you train reflects the mindset that that philosophy is teaching hmm. so if you're if you're kickboxing there's nothing wrong with that but that's the mindset you'll be in when you get in a fight is punching and kicking so for me the somatic the body mind connection hmm. just like with yoga it, it's so important i think to be in a physical practice because hmm. think about what um, in jujitsu what tapping out does that that's what is literally tenderizing your ego and I think mm -hmm. with Aikido, it's the same. There's a practice of blending or flowing that, and even just if you want to embody a kind of centeredness or groundedness or presence, that's how you're, that's where traditional martial arts came from to begin with. They were temple practices. Like you'd sit for a long time in meditation. And then how did you integrate that into you know, your day-to-day -day life? So you weren't just sitting all day. You would do moving meditation. So there's something about the kind of, presence or the kind of embodiment you have from a physical practice that does carry with you off of the mat. Um, you could attempt to make it a non-physical thing, um, but I, it, it would take away from, of course, what it has to offer as a physical practice. And again, the challenge with that is if you're not sparring, then that's the same problem as doing spirituality without psychology. Mm. So that's another disconnect to speak to the negative side of it is if you only train Aikido as it is without ever sparring, um, you know, you're only going to be so functionally capable of uh, creating a nonviolent outcome or of confronting all the parts of yourself that come up when you spar. Mm. So you're only going to develop so far in any one thing, I think would be another way of saying that. Mm. So best practices, you mentioned there's something to say there. Yeah. So just like on the mat, um, let's say we have stand up, clinch, ground, and self-defense. Uh, and it really helps to cross train in all four of those um, if you want to uh, be well-rounded as a martial artist. And actually that's the quickest way to go to the next level as a martial artist not as someone who's good at a particular sport. Hmm. Um, the same thing is true off the mat. Um, and I, I said body, mind, spirit before. I think that would be a, a pretty quick way of, uh, of going through it. But um, first and foremost, um, what is needed in the world today? That would be another question to ask. Why, what is the value proposition of Aikido in the world today? Hmm. And if you go all the way back again to ancient Greece and those philosophical dialogues that were going on, alongside the wrestling and pancreation that was based on the Socratic method and uh, Plato's dialectic. Well, what is that? Well, it's quite a lot um, like shadow work in the sense that you're asked to argue both sides of an argument so that you can see uh, from a higher order perspective. So what is Aikido teaching us? When we meet force with force, we get into an argument. And I think you've spoken about this online, even in the whole notion of blending with taking someone's perspective first before you offer your own. That's all that Aikido is teaching is mm. and judo is teaching that too. When you're pulled, you push. And when you're pushed, you pull. So that principle of blending 
So there's a trend that's going on called um, straw man versus steel man. If you straw man someone else's argument, um, you are portraying their argument in the worst possible light and even putting words in their mouth to make the argument sound stupid so that you can one-up them mm. uh, or manipulate people to join your side. But a steel man on the other side is can you mirror back to someone else their argument so well that they wish they'd said it themselves? Mm. So you've truly taken their perspective. You can see this in the Sam Harris, Jordan Peterson debates that happened last mm. year. That's an Aikido principle. Mm. And again, it's, it's about harmonizing opposites and it's about reconciliation of conflict. Mm. Because again, when you're in a debate or a conflict, the, pr the purpose of a debate is actually not to win your side. It's to pressure test and see what's true and evolve what's true from a third person perspective. So you can even see um, in some of the postings where people post two opposing videos and ask people to comment. Like here's one perspective, here's the opposite. The comment section is much more harmonious hmm. because they're forced into that third person objective perspective and to evaluate two opposites. So that would be the first best practice. I call it hashtag let's play catch, which means I have to catch your argument before I get to throw it back. So what that sounds like is what I hear you saying is, did I get that right? And then if you say no, it's like this, then I have to say, okay. What I hear you saying is, did I get that right? Until they say, yes, you are hearing me. You actually hear me. And it's as simple as bringing in the element of inquiry with advocacy. We're so good at saying what we think, but we don't go into a receptive mode to inquire, ask questions, in other words, or to receive. And so, of course, we remain bullheaded and closed-minded and in group think, non-critical thinking. So that's that's the first thing, steel man. And mm -hmm. it would be fun to practice these with you at some point. We offer these in our, our uh, integral leadership coaching academy. Mm -hmm. um, so again, if you just study to be a coach, then you don't know how to debate well or do this practice. It's a totally different toolkit. It's like doing boxing versus wrestling. So we teach our leaders and, and leadership coaches to um, do this practice of debate. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one, very simple. If at any point during that debate or any team meeting or any interpersonal interaction, you feel triggered emotionally and you get angry or afraid or want to fight, flight, freeze, or please, as we say, you can communicate differently. So learning different feedback formulas. But what the research has shown is it does not matter if you just teach people how to give feedback. The Harvard Negotiation Project, um, after 20 years, all their research, they found out something else which is that uh, they, they, it was so important that they wrote a whole other book about it called Thanks for the Feedback, which again is to say, if you don't, it doesn't matter if you teach people to give feedback, if you don't also teach them how to receive it. Mm. So imagine you and I boxing and only having been taught how to punch without being learned how to cover up or defend. So that's the same thing that happens in organizations. You give people offense and there's no defense. So guess what um, giving and receiving feedback is a lot like? It's a lot like Aikido. It's a lot like verbal judo. You actually have to take their perspective first, which means you mirror it back to them, um, which is a basic mirroring, which is can you even repeat what someone said? But then you get into empathizing. How does that impact them? What emotions come up in them? And um, what do they value? What's important to them? So being able to connect to why it matters to them. And that's that whole move about, you know, connecting to their core in Aikido. The core is your core value. It's your heart also in Latin. Um, and then regardless, how do you redirect that towards something constructive? Because we could sit here and blame each other all day and spin mm -hmm. our wheels. Or once I actually hear that you're upset and it's because actually you value integrity and I didn't keep my commitment, well, what would you have me do differently? What would, what would you suggest? And then I can hear that as your perspective and we're redirecting that energy towards a constructive outcome. So it's not just the, the giving the feedback, but it's also learning how to receive it. And that is what conflict resolution is. And there are many approaches um, to that nonviolent communication, 
works well. I've adapted it. I call it values-based communication for the business work that I do. Um, so that's full stop on the second one, like interpersonal conflict and communication. Um, and you can, again, study that in a lot of different, a lot of marriage and family therapy approaches have to do with perspective taking as well in that sense. Mm. Mm. And then the third one is back to mindset. How do I deal with my ego in the first place when I feel triggered by you? Maybe I feel angry, but maybe I feel hurt. And this comes back to, well, yeah, how do you deal with the ego? Does it inform me or does it affect me? Okay, it affects me. That's what shadow work is. That's what inquiry is, self-inquiry is. And again, you can, I think the first level practice would be to study mindsets and personality types and start to understand yourself a little better. Why do you get triggered? by certain things and not others so there's any number of personality typing systems but there's disc there's myers-briggs there's enneagram depending on how scientific you care to be about that but they all start to get at the same thing is your ego you know what do you think you ought to be to be okay and what do you not allow yourself to be and that's your persona versus your shadow the parts of yourself that you haven't integrated or that are unconscious in you um, and, you know, then to actually get into doing shadow work, um, that is the most important practice of, of all, um, because it starts, you know, leadership starts from the inside out. out. If you can't shift your, your, yourself into a more conscious mindset, how can you shift anyone else in a conflict or in a debate? It, it's impossible. So you have to look in the mirror at yourself first. As a leader, especially, you can't say who hired all these idiots or, how come this business isn't performing? It's like, that's a mirror for you. There's something inside of you that you're not conscious of. So I'll pause there. And, and I, I think it would be worth going into a brief example of how to do shadow work as well, um, if that's of interest. But I'll just stop there as kind of the, the one, two, three. Hmm. Well, if, if you do have time still. Uh, I, I, I do have to... time. I'm not in a rush. Mm -hmm. Let me double check. Then, mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a, I have, yeah, I have time. Sure thing. Okay. So I, I, I'm interested if that's a possibility for you to continue elaborating about the shadow self. Yes. So, and this is really the answer to the question in a world that is so hyperpolarized right now. Mm where everyone has um, an inherent bias about the other side and they really only see the healthy side of their own perspective and they only see the unhealthy side of someone else's perspective. Mm. How do you cut through that polarity? <clears throat> this is a martial arts problem. I'm the hero, you're the villain. I'm right, you're wrong, we're in a fight. But as the old Pogo quote goes, we have discovered the enemy and he is us. This is the whole thing that you see in the hero's journey. The hero sets out on a journey uh, as soon as he accepts the call to adventure and he confronts an enemy. But the enemy actually shows him something about himself. And of course, Star Wars is great for this because you see, you know, Luke, I am your father. There's a lot of funny videos these days of people showing that moment to their kids on YouTube. Like they're watching the, oh my God, and this, their reaction, how they, uh, how they are so amazed, like, oh my God, the bad guy is Luke's father. Um, but that, that's what shadow work is. So, so to talk about it in this way, the shadow is all of the parts of yourself that you've disowned or denied that are now unconscious. And it goes back to your, the way your personality forms in childhood. So certain things are good and bring you love and approval and appreciation and other things that you demonstrated inside of yourself got you punished or got you wounded or yelled at in some way. And so you adopt a personality, a persona very quickly, which says, uh, look at boys and girls, for example, boys are tough. Boys don't cry. Girls are sweet. Girls aren't bossy. And so you immediately, you split yourself in half. And you start um, trying not to, sh for if you're a boy, you start trying not to show when you feel sensitive or sad. 
and you keep suppressing it and suppressing it, which means trying not to feel it because it got you yelled at, remember? You try not to feel it until it becomes unavailable to consciousness. It becomes totally repressed. Now, what this means is just because it's um, unconscious doesn't mean it isn't present. It's just pushed down. And so the only way you tend to experience your own unconscious is through projection. Now, this alone sets us up to do self-actualization work. Because when we, as Carl Jung said, um, projection turns the world into one's unknown self. Or as O-sensei would say, the enemy is within. So when you get emotionally triggered by something, that again is the litmus test that you're looking in the mirror at an unconscious part of yourself mm. and you're making it an enemy and you think the enemy is out there, but it's really something in here. So take for, let's, be, let's put it to work for a second. Um, can you find that you don't like aggressive people? Can you find that? Myself? Yeah. Um, I definitely was not fond of them in the past. Like, especially in my Aikido days, active Aikido days. Uh, not Can you that find I a time them? when you were with someone who was aggressive and you didn't like it? Sorry? Can you find just an example of one time, like, in your mind where someone was aggressive and it maybe it triggered you? I think I could find multiple ones. But I think... The one which is on the front of my mind, um, I'm thinking if that if this example applies in mm -hmm. the beginning days of my jiu-jitsu, and I still study in my home in my hometown of the day in Lithuania, mm -hmm. uh, I was upset about people who would be you know, too aggressive in rolling. Mm -hmm. So I could like I can picture like that spe one specific role in my mind where I was like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, I don't know if that's an example. Yeah. And just for everyone listening, it's like, find your own example and we'll just use it as a, an abstract example in principle. Um, and if you can walk through it with your own example, then you'll make it more personal. But yeah. um, the simplest way is when I'm triggered by someone outside of me who is aggressive, again, I'm believing a thought. That emotion says aggressive people are dangerous or being aggressive is bad. Mm. And when I believe that, then I have that reaction to that person. But they're really just a mirror for something inside of me that I'm believing is bad. So you can use simple four quadrants where bottom quadrants are unhealthy and the top quadrants are healthy. And you can take any polarity, like we, we started with aggressive and we're gonna walk it through on that basis. So let's say aggressive is a negative quality and we don't like that in them. Doing shadow work would be to look at maybe in that situation, they weren't being aggressive. Maybe I'm just seeing it that way. And so mm -hmm. why would that be? And what's the, what's the positive side of being aggressive? What's the upside of being aggressive? What's the word for that? Maybe yeah, assertive. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. Does that work? Maybe a more conscious yeah. version of being aggressive would be to be assertive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or to take care of myself. Someone who takes care of themselves first is more assertive. So um, then you look at examples. Can you see how that might be true about that other person? And maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But regardless, mm -hmm. if, if they're aggressive, um, where, and this is where you can start to look at the projection now, where am I aggressive towards them? Mm. That's the look in the mirror, the finger pointing, right? I'm aggressive to aggressive people. I get triggered about that. And can I find an example or three examples of that? Where am I aggressive? towards them hmm. and then you you go to the self so it's kind of three two one first third person they're not aggressive second person where am i aggressive to them and then first person i'm aggressive to myself 
I'm aggressive with myself. What does that mean? Maybe I'm aggressive towards my own aggression. Maybe that's what causes me to repress my own assertiveness. And when you can see it that way, then you can see that maybe you think of yourself as a, 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 a um, what would be the opposite of aggressive? Maybe you're a kind person. And, and what's the downside of being a kind person? True answer. What if you're too nice? Yeah. Hmm. Well, uh, people can take advantage of you. Or well, that's probably the first thing. Yeah. So you become passive, hmm. which is also the opposite of aggressive, isn't it? Hmm. So seen through that lens, the enemy becomes the friend. The person who I thought was being aggressive to me is actually showing me where I repress that aggression in myself. And it becomes the very thing that I need to be more of an assertive person myself. So the shadow is that I, I think you're being aggressive when really I'm being aggressive. I'm being aggressive to you because I hate that aggression in you. And I hate that part of myself. And so how do I find a healthy expression for that aggression within me so that I can become more assertive? And that's the making peace, the reconciliation with the opposite. That enemy becomes a friend inside of me so that I can call upon that part of myself when I need it. So that's a lot of deep thoughts, but it's three, two, one. You know, maybe it's not what I think. It isn't aggression. Mm. Maybe I'm aggressive to that person who is aggressive. Maybe I'm aggressive to aggression in general. And I'm aggressive with myself. Nice people are aggressive with themselves, if you think about it. Mm. Like, I don't matter if I'm always taking care of everyone else. So this is where this goes. You see, you find the aggression within yourself and you transmute it into something helpful. And it, because it's actually the thing you need the most, it, it can save your life. And this is what self-actualization is in that sense too. You, you integrate all these different parts of yourself um, so that you're more self-actualized, more autonomous as a human being. Hmm. Mm. So what question, that, that's, a, that's a lot, this is a very deep process. It's like concentrated psychotherapy. So what, does that make sense or do any questions come up? Yeah, no, it does make sense. It does, it does. Uh, I guess one of the things I wanted to ask in relation to this is, uh, part, partly out of just curiosity, uh, so we spoke about before about the physical aspect of it. And I'm wondering in your own, way that you coach or or you mentor people i don't know which is the right term but when you work with people uh do you implement the physical aspect in this process as well or when you work with shadow it's and you work with your clients it's primarily through this process yeah so the i mean ideally um anyone who would come to the dojo it would be great that they it's like i want people to have coaches on and off the mat so that they are engaged in both. Um, but as far as my professional work, the embodied leadership, um, I do use it quite often for executive team offsites or um, CEO forum retreats. And we've had very powerful, very transformative results from that. So we do a clinch wrestling and we use that clinch wrestling to talk about the redirecting energy move. And then we do perspective taking and they have tensions with each other. They have conflict with each other. And so we use that perspective taking process, which is literally verbal Aikido, verbal Judo, whichever you prefer. And they, they say things they've been holding on to for months or a year, mm. maybe years. And so they, it provides a safe structure. We joke, follow the form to prevent injury, just like on the mat. So um, it provides a structure for them to do conflict um, safely. It's almost like an isolation drill in jujitsu or something. Um, so that's been very transformative. And the physical stuff gets people bonded and connected really quickly. And then they also learn about how to breathe and be centered and relaxed. So it, it goes well with the meditation that we do in that context. Um, yeah. If someone wants to do a 
<clears throat> embodied leadership coaching engagement with me, then yes, that would involve regular practice in martial arts. Because again, I love to see how the people show up. I've definitely done that over the years. Uh, and then that pairs with whatever coaching work uh, we do off the mat. And it, it really is a, a pretty high octane accelerator for people, especially if they're kind of plateaued or stuck in their development as a, mm -hmm. as a leader. Um, and otherwise the shadow work is more advanced, but how powerful to have, again, teams um, who are doing, I mean, think about a thought like, uh, you know, he doesn't listen to me. It's like to do shadow work on that thought, what do you think you see in the mirror? Like, well, actually maybe he does listen to you. It's not all the time that he doesn't listen to you. Have you ever considered that maybe you don't listen to him? Mm. And then where are you not listening to yourself? Where do you not take your own advice? So this, mm. is, this is leadership. How can you lead if you're not conscious of your shadow? You're a hypocrite. Mm. So again, like you're pointing the finger at the people who report to you if you're the CEO. So there's mm. something inherent about leadership itself with shadow work because you have to be willing to, you know, in, in the, it's like remove the thing from your own eye before you point out the thing in someone else's eye so you can see clearly. Mm. And, and that I think again is the Aikido move of blending. So mm. when you have teams who are willing to admit to each other uh, and, uh, and make amends for the places they've been in denial of, of what they're doing wrong, it's the most powerful and most transformative thing you can do to build trust and connectedness on that team. Yeah. Because again, you're rolling. It's like you're rolling together. You go into the conflict, you look at where you're open and you make amends for where you're open. You tap out. And when people see that you're willing to do that, then everyone starts learning and growing together. And that's the kind of spirit I try to bring to organizations as well is when we really grow ourselves, we grow together which means we're more authentic, we're tapping out, we're, we have a growth mindset. Um, you're perfect just the way you are, but you could use a little work. So when everyone's working on themselves and we're doing that together, it does create that same feeling as in jujitsu um, or whatever martial art you're doing, where you're, you're that in that, that's your tribe, you know? That's your band of brothers and sisters. Um, yeah. I, I think that's the interesting thing is when you, people don't like to do conflict, because they think it will um, ruin their relationships. But there's a, there's a whole other level of trust on the other side of conflict. Yeah. And that's, again, the metaphor of being on the mat and rolling around, bringing that aliveness to the engagement so that everyone's working on themselves, everyone's growing, but that we're using each other as the mirror you know, to work on ourselves. Yeah. There's only a couple last questions I wanted to ask, and one is more or less a continuation to what you just said, uh, which I was actually very intrigued about to ask. Uh, something you just slightly mentioned today, and I think you might have mentioned that in one of the, our, our previous talks and meetings, uh, but I don't know exactly the answer. So uh, you mentioned about leaders taking feedback. I guess it's, a, again, a, an impression from a collection of the talks we had I just just want to clarify so would you in your in, in your work would you take a leader and present him with the kind of challenge or or the exercise to meet up with his uh what's the right word employees and receive feedback from them would that be like a, an active process that you would engage a leader in through your work Yes, and actually this is, it's worth tying back to the whole thing about being spiritual or even being conscious in that sense. It is just like the problem with Aikido mm. because business leaders um, can have conscious businesses mm. that are based on having a higher purpose, like doing some good for the world. Like you buy one pair of our shoes, we buy a pair for a person in need. That's beautiful. Yeah. And they have core values that reflect that, like, you know, open-mindedness and harmony and, you know, personal growth and all this really lovely stuff. Um, and 
they can still have uh, the kind of organization where people just feel good and they give them bonuses and benefits, um, but they don't actually spar. They don't actually bring the aliveness. The feedback doesn't actually flow up. Mm. So this is what I mean when it's, it's a disruption. It's something that is different. The, the approach that we use is, is based on Robert Keegan at Harvard and it's to do specifically with adult development. And he called it, actually the book is here, uh, an everyone culture, but it's the deliberately developmental organization. What would it mean for business to be a place that you go to grow as a person? Yeah. And how many people would say the place they go to work makes them better as a person? Yeah. So that requires sparring. Yeah. That, and Ray Dalio's company, Bridgewater, in his book, Principles, came out uh, the last couple of years. That's a lot closer to what we're talking about. Mm. Like, yes, leaders receive feedback. They ask for it first, it flows up. But we're constantly pressure testing uh, our ideas with each other. And we're, if we have feedback for each other, we take care of that first. Personal feedback comes first so that we can get really aligned and coherent and high performing as a team. And then we take on the problems, the tensions in the business. And you know, Dalio, Ray Dalio talks about the idea meritocracy you want the best ideas to win, not the biggest egos. That's what we're doing in jujitsu or in mixed martial arts. Yeah. You know, you, you want to be in a process of continuous improvement. Bruce Lee, again, it's a process of continuing growth, self-actualization, self-actualization where you're constantly um, iterating and pressure testing to see um, what ideas are the best ideas. And the companies who do that tend to outperform the ones that just have you know, best places to work. You know, I've, I've walked into companies that literally have won the best place to work in San Diego, for example. Mm. And when you assess the team, there's assessments you can do on teamwork, like Pat Lancioni's assessment. It's the whole pyramid, trust, conflict, uh, commitment, accountability, results. The whole thing is red, in the red, like way below average. So mm. how can that happen, that you're a best place to work but people don't trust each other. You know, they don't do conflict well. No one's aligned on the strategy. You don't hold each other, you don't call each other out. And you're, you're more oriented to your own personal success than you are to the collective success of the team. How does that happen? Mm. Well, spiritual bypassing. Mm. It's the same thing. So feedback is the mechanism of evolution and growth. That's what aliveness is. That's the beauty of that philosophy of aliveness is the way nature evolves. It's like you get bumped and then you adapt. You get bumped and then you adapt. It's a play. It doesn't have to be a fight. It's just aliveness. There's, there's movement. There's freedom of speech. And the way that we do that, which again, um, is not unlike an Aikido philosophy uh, principle, is perspective. It's not even, we have to upgrade the notion of feedback to perspective. Because feedback is the noise that the mic makes when it's, you know, like that's where the word feedback came from. It's not very pleasant. And it often does involve people telling you how you are, putting you down. But what if that feedback was just a perspective? It's just the truth as I see it. It's data interpreted. Nothing more, nothing less. Hopefully that would allow us to have a more perspective rich environment where we're able to give and receive perspectives. Mm. Um, and it's not like Carol Dweck's research. You don't have to be in such a fixed mindset, like thinking you're a stupid person when you make a mistake. There's more of a growth mindset where making mistakes doesn't mean I'm stupid. It's part of how you learn. I'm not a stupid person. I might've done something that didn't work, but that's such a huge developmental shift. Whether people are in shame and blame, and they think of themselves as smart or stupid, or there's just what worked and what didn't, and what can we do differently so we keep growing. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, that's what feedback or perspective, being in a relationship to perspectives is all about. Um, and I find that um, empowers people um, both. It's just like coming into sparring when you've never sparred before. Mm -hmm. You're empowered to actually attack me. I want you to speak your truth to me. Because that makes me better. And then when it's my turn, I'm going to do that for you too. And we're both going to get better.
And that's, that's the beauty of the aliveness. And we can do that in a way that we don't have to trigger each other or, or have our egos be a part of it. And if they do, if our egos do become a part of it, um, then that's where we go to work on ourselves off of the mat so that we can still um, grow our trust through this, this messy human experience that we're having. Now, you know, of course, we're going to trigger each other and piss each other off um, when we're sparring or when we're debating or when there's real results on, on the line in the business. But the beauty is when we get triggered, that's happening for us. When we have the tools to work on ourselves, it's happening for us. It's not happening to us. Because those show us our blind spots. Those show us um, where we're stuck. And it, it puts us back into our process of continuous self transformation. Mm. Yeah, it makes me think yet again about the, comparing it obviously to my martial arts experience. And I think of traditional martial arts, which is a term I try to avoid, but I think it makes sense. And let's see, even more so Aikido, which as you mentioned before, it's hierarchy based where the sensei is not usually questioned. It's not encouraged. No one encourages to question the sensei. And the feedback as well from what I experienced is usually quite tough. It's top to bottom usually, mm -hmm. like the, the higher person tells you what you're doing wrong and that's usually just reinforcing what the sensei said mm -hmm. versus an actual feedback. When I look at the positive side of combat sports, let's see Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, boxing, Let's see, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, there's, um, um, there's the direct feedback you, where you tap. And if you do the wrong move, you'll quickly learn about that and you'll constantly be shown your mistakes. And when I look and compare the leaders, and it's a, it's a thing I'd like to bring up quite often in discussions or even in my personal explorations. In that traditional model, uh, the sensei, in a way, it's very, a very fragile place to be. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's like, if you question the sensei, usually the sensei gets upset about that or, or shuts you down somehow. And, and, and there's a lot of force and energy that needs to be invested to maintain the, the sitting position on the throne, the respect and everything. There's mm -hmm. a whole complicated system to support it. And, but it's kind of superficial. Uh, on the other hand, what I transitioning from that to, to combat sports, I was very impressed by the other side of the model where you have the coach. You have right the coach uh, exactly, not the sensei. Right, exactly, not and the master. That, right, right. And what's interesting is that usually, like everybody respects and loves the coach, especially in a healthy place in a healthy gym or academy and it's not because the coach tries to enforce it not by any means but it's a natural respect because everybody's aware that that person kind of like similar to what you said that could be one of the points like he failed more than all of us all together he tapped out he could probably beat me very quickly and even if a fighter surpasses the coach there's still a tremendous amount of respect nonetheless if he's not based he's not you know respected just because he's better but there's a whole sense of just an awe at, at other aspects of, of something that is just naturally proved to others without forcing it. So it almost seems like those are two different models which could be applied on the executive level as well, which, which is really yes. yeah. We're Very well said. I mean, to talk about the yin and yang again, something which is rigid has a shadow of fragility. And you see that in traditional martial arts. It's too much static, masculine repetition of form. There's yeah. not enough dynamism. There's no sparring. And um, so when you, ironically, when you go to sparring, people think, oh, that's going to be violent if you're into Aikido. Yeah. But actually what's ha what happens is you become softer and yeah. you become more powerful. So the yin and yang start to mean in integration. And of course, if your objective is to control someone without hurting them, well, then you're all the better at that. Um, but it re does require um, breaking through the, the, the top-down hierarchy. And we call that a dictatorship in government. You know, monarchy, maybe. 
but yeah. one way or another, functionally, it is an absolute power. Mm. And just the word coach is so brilliant because what is the purpose of a coach? Like a coach in his identity is satisfied because he makes his athlete better than he is. Okay. Whereas when you're in a top-down hierarchy, oh, you're never going to be better than the person above you. Yeah. That is, you know, off with their heads if you do that. Mm -hmm. And so when I enter into a, a business culture, you know, I ask executive teams, how many people would say that the companies that they've been a part of actually um, are democracies? Actually, you're empowered to free speech. You can say anything you want to the CEO. And he'll say, thank you. Tell me more. Why do you see it that way? How many, how many people actually have been to work in places like that? So again, the, my job, in, if we're interested in culture transformation, is to turn, you know, sometimes you have the benevolent dictatorship and that, that's okay, the good king. But it's, again, to break down that, that power over dynamic so that a person is not a dictator it's like they learn to empower people to freedom of speech and that's what brings more aliveness to the team and that that also is the same thing as um, what happens in martial arts it's like guess what not only am i not better than you in every single possible way um mm. there there are a multitude of things like maybe i'm better in one dimension but you're better in another so, you know, you're great with boxing because you did that for 20 years, mm. but I have the jujitsu. So you start to mm. just have a more like egalitarian relationship to um, it's a, a team is a team amongst equals. And as they say in, in martial arts, you know, it's any puncher's chance when you really go for it. It's like, you don't know what's going to happen in a fight if you're all training um, the same kinds of things. So that's, that's what allows a team to be in a more interdependent relationship. And that's where you get to a lot of the stuff that's so great with Phil Jackson and the Chicago Bulls. You see mm -hmm. Zen basketball. They brought mm -hmm. mindfulness to the most winning team in the history of the NBA. And they study mindfulness and they study team flow. And it's like something else flows through that team. It's like the Navy SEALs that act like the amoeba, like any person takes a lead and they form around that person. So there's this amazing collective intelligence that happens um, when you're able to set your ego to the side and form uh, a network in that sense, that kind of, mm. that kind of teamwork, so. Mm. A question before the last one, and I, I, I hope this will be one that can be answered in, in a short way, uh, but when you teach, I'm sure it can be answered both short and long, but, uh just the basic concept of it when you work with a team uh, i see that it should be such a huge challenge for a leader uh to to go into such a model because it's threatening for to in many degrees especially to if if that structure was already there so i, pre I presume that there is a um, need for like a project prerequisite of the leader to be interested in the process Mm -hmm. But I also guess that there's a, I just try to imagine the way you do that work. And I'm guessing that you're, you're probably teaching both sides, the leader to receive feedback, like the right, the correct methods and the team to give feedback in the right way, or is it more mm -hmm. just focusing on the leader or the feedback or, or, or both? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great point. I mean, for those who watched Jocko Willink the other night on Joe Rogan, he says something that I've said all along as well, <clears throat> which is that leadership skills can be practiced like jujitsu techniques. And if you practice them, you get better. Mm. So that is our whole approach. It's, it's not a two day training. It's a practice. So feedback, there's a form just like there is for doing an arm bar on a plot of triangle. There's a form that you use to script your feedback. And we agree mm -hmm. that that's the way we want to communicate together because it's more effective and it prevents fights. So mm -hmm. yes, you practice that. You practice looking in the mirror at yourself and mm -hmm. we do it together. It is a community of practice. Um, and the, to keep with the theme of, of interdependence, of like how do you get to that team flow? Um, there's a, a famous Buddhist teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh, 
And he said, the next Buddha will be a Sangha, which for those who don't know those terms, like the next enlightened person, the next Buddha will be the community. That's a brilliant phrase because in the leadership context, it it, it dispels the myth of the heroic, rugged individualist. Mm -hmm. Like what if we can get more out of this business if we attempt to get more out of the team? So that's how, even if people ask me, do I coach executives? I would say, "Mm, I coach executive teams and up-leveling the team dynamic is the best way to up-level any individual executive. Yeah. So if you don't have the team practicing together, if you don't have the team giving and receiving feedback as equals, it, imagine how far can you go as an individual on that team? Yeah. Mm, so that's the medium good. answer. <laughs> yeah, right. That, that, that was perfect. That was great. Yeah. And I'm thinking, you know, this, there's always, I think we have so much to talk about uh, that it's, it's endless, but, but since it's on record, it's always also good to kind of keep it in a certain frame. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think for, for this one, uh, I'd like to ask the the final question, which, uh, in the latest series of my podcasts, I like to ask this question a lot. So, uh, what would be your summary of this conversation? Mm -hmm. Great question. Well, we started at the top talking about applied Aikido philosophy. And I would say to all martial artists that the value proposition of Aikido is um, nonviolent self-defense and self-development. So um, if you're interested in um, practicing that on the mat, then um, obviously you need to practice in a way that deals with um, nage uke like responding to attacks and, and like spar that way, have someone attack you MMA and try to take them down and submit them without hurting them. And you watch the old Gracie Jiu Jitsu videos and that's a lot of what that Vali Tudo stuff is like. So um, if you are also interested in self-development off the mat, you also have to cross train. And I would do that um, with the three core practices we talked about. Um, do it so I we it do shadow work study mindsets personality types work on yourself with that or get a coach or therapist who can help you so the we space is the communication space study um, perspective taking and conscious communication um, you could check out nonviolent communication or, or SBI is another thing I'm also happy to share some resources if people want around how we do um, communication and conflict. And then third, I, we, it, when you're in a, uh, a debate, um, whether it's at work or just politically these days, practice, you know, hashtag let's play catch or steel man challenge. Practice mirroring back, in fact, set it up, almost as if there's a moderator, set it up so that you start practicing taking perspectives, inquiring before you advocate. And those three things alone um, can change your life, change your relationships, um, and put you on your own hero's journey. And actually, you just reminded uh, the last bit, where can people find you? Yes, and I forgot to, to mention meditation as well, but um, mm. I think that's a good good thing regardless. The scientific research does show ecological mm. development does um, occur or is more likely to occur through the practice of meditation. Necessary, they say meditation is necessary, but not sufficient for uh, psychological like development, but it creates the conditions where you're more aware. So that, of course, was my foundation growing up as well. Nice. So. Um, So yes, you can find me at Integral Martial Arts on Facebook. Um, You can find uh, Palaistra Leadership is thepalaistra.com, T-H-E-P-A-L-A-E-S-T-R-A.com. If you are a professional, like a a leader, an executive, uh, an L&D person, or a coach, we have an online coaching academy. It's an online Mm. peer coaching academy. So that is our virtual dojo of coaching. Mm. So you're welcome to join us um, on Fridays. 
and be uh, in a dojo, a membership-based community of practice where we practice these tools. So we practice coaching and inquiry, um, but we also practice the communication and, um, and the debate stuff too. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's our, our mixed martial arts of, of coaching um, academy. And um, uh, yeah, otherwise you can follow me on uh, all the usuals, YouTube, mm -hmm. Instagram, and so on. Yeah. Just by typing your name and surname? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, Integral Martial Arts, we're on um, Instagram and YouTube as well. Thanks. Cool. Well, thank you, Nathaniel. I really appreciate your, your time and uh, every everything you shared here. Uh, a lot of it really made me connect some dots and probably not everything was evident on video, but there's a lot of things I'm thinking about these days. And a lot of the things you mentioned were like, oh, okay, that makes sense, that makes sense, and these connect, and that's connect, that connects. So I'm sure a lot of the things you've spoken about will come up in me as I will continue my journey, and I'll probably quote you quite a bit. <laughs> I'm glad. Uh, and as a coach, I have to ask you, how would you summarize what we talked mm. about? What are, what are your takeaways? Um, I have, I feel I'm inclined right now to kind of, um, look at what I personally gained. I could look at the general structure and narrative of the conversation, but I'm quite inspired about quite a few things you mentioned and relating to my own personal journey, the emphasis of cross-training uh, on and off the mat and um, the idea that, especially if, if we look at the Aikido philosophy, that it's not enough to just train Aikido to, to really embody it and that the cross training should happen not only physically but also on the mental level in trying different things uh, also the idea of pressure testing applied at the executive level which is how that whole aspect can be applied uh, in uh, the working environment uh, i'm sure outside of it too but found it to be a very inspiring concept and what was the last thing I wanted to bring up? Um, and yes, the shadow side, the, the idea of bypassing the shadow side, the importance of recognizing that it exists and that the regular spiritual practice may not be enough to, to work with it. And it's, it almost seems like it's our own, partly our own responsibility uh, to, to be aware of that and to make sure that we engage ourselves on that level as well, not only on the spiritual level. So those those were the three things that are on the top at the top of my mind, but there were plenty of things that, that resonated with me. So so thank you. Great summary. Yeah. Thank you. Great. So yes, I think as I said at the beginning of the conversation, this is you know, not the first, but I also Hope not the last talk. I'm sure we'll have plenty of things to look at in the future. And I'm very uh, open to it anytime. Thank you. Thank you. I, I was about to say there's still plenty of more things that I, I will want to ask. I think it will be good to digest these things and take a look at them. But but I'll be looking forward to connect up again in the future. So Great. thank you. Thank you, Rokas. Yeah. yeah.